بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين I declare that there is no other God worthy of worship other than Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the final messenger of Allah Assalamu alaikum Today we are going to talk about one of the subjects that I enjoy speaking about the most and that is the glorious Quran and the subject title today is Book of Light and the Quran is a book of light because it dispels darkness. Now, many scientists have studied light and they look at the reflection of light and how it moves through different objects and how light can be captured. And one of the things that is still remains a mystery is how we cannot produce dark light, or not effectively. In dark light, imagine if you had a torch and you could switch it on in the light and it would just dispel all the light and it would turn into darkness. You see, we can take a torch or a flashlight and you flash it into the darkness and it dispels all the darkness and you can see just light. And it's amazing, that is one of the wonders of this world, is that light will always conquer darkness. And so the Quran dispels darkness, it reveals truth, it takes away the negativity and it replaces it with positivity. And I don't mean that in an esoterical sense, I mean that in a realistic, factual, down-to-earth sense, where when you reduce the Quran to someone, you give the Quran to somebody, you read verses of the Quran to somebody, it dispels darkness, it gives them hope, it gives them a sense of well-being. And so when we look at the Quran and we do a study today of, a, of what the Quran is, a way to tell others about the Quran, I ask that you would get yourself a copy, if you can. Get yourself a copy of the Quran and, and try to get a copy of the Quran in the language that you understand it. So if you're German, get a German Quran. If you're English, get an English Quran. If you're Urdu, get an Urdu Quran. If you're from South Africa and you're Zulu, get a Zulu Quran. And in that way, you'll understand what the Quran is about. Then, obviously, once you understand the Quran fully, then you can get it in Arabic and then start learning it in Arabic and start reciting it in Arabic. But today, we're going to ask that you get yourself a Quran in the language that you understand it. And you have this Quran with you all the time. Because this weapon is going to be a weapon against darkness. You're going to take this Quran into war with you. And when you go into war against the enemy, you need to have the best weapon possible to have maximum results. Now, this, the Quran, the Holy Quran, is the weapon that you will dispel evil with. You will have victory and you will have success in every area of your life if you learn to apply the Quran. So what you need to do is you need to get yourself a Quran and start marking it. And the reason I say you should get in the language of, of your choice or the language that you understand the best is so that you'll be able to understand an, an overview of the entire Quran. Now, imagine a, a bird flying over your city and it looks at, down at all the streets and the roads. It doesn't know the names of the streets, it doesn't know the road names and details, it doesn't know the numbers, but it gets an overview of the whole city. And we call it a bird's eye view. And so, when we read the Quran, we go through the Quran together, and the lessons that I give, or the subjects that I do in this course that I'm doing with you, we we're going to give you a bird's eye view of many of the books. And we're going to give you today a bird's eye view of the Quran. And so what you need to do is you need to learn to, to take your Quran and mark in the Quran certain things. So perhaps you want to mark in your Quran about prayer. Maybe you want to mark in your Quran about how important it is to fast. Or maybe you want to mark in the Quran how the Quran says that it will be preserved and prevents it. No one will be able to destroy it or change it. So what you do is you open your Quran and you find those verses. You write on the margin next to it the, what the topic is and then you highlight it. So that when you're talking to people in the future, you can take the Quran to them and at any time when they ask you questions, you'll be able to open up to that page on that topic and be able to speak freely about it. So we're going to use the Quran as a weapon to dispel darkness. See, the Quran is a timeless perfection and you must know this. You must get to know the Quran and you must spend time reading it and you must spend time learning to absorb it into every part of your life. And so... The mission of Islam is to propagate Islam and to tell people about the Holy Quran. And when they understand the Holy Quran, that will help them get a closer relationship with Allah to Allah. So the book, the Holy Quran, or the Book of Light, it talks about itself. You see, unlike the Bible, where we don't find the word Bible mentioned anywhere in the Bible, or the Bhagavad Gita, where we don't hear it be called the Bhagavad Gita, we hear in the Quran, it, it identifies itself and it talks about itself. So in the Holy Quran, it says in the 14th chapter, in the first verse, it says that the book which was revealed to you, O Muhammad, 
so that you may lead the people out of darkness into the light. You see, the book that was revealed would be a book that would take people out of darkness and bring them into the light. And so as we read the Quran and as we study the Quran, we find that it is like taking a negative, a negative maybe from uh, you've had a broken leg or whatever and you put the negative up against the light and it shows you all the problems that you have in your life. It shows you where the cracks are, where there are problems in your life and it dispels the evil so you can find the cure. Once you've taken your problems against the Quran and you superimpose it over each other, it tells you where the problems are in your life. And you slowly but surely start to deal with them one at a time and you remove them. Remember, Islam is a religion of gradualism. Things take place stage by stage, slowly but surely. They don't have it all happen overnight. And so what happens when you start studying the Quran and when you start becoming a practicing Muslim, what happens, you start removing all those things that are negative in your life one by one. So why is the Quran the living miracle that we as Muslims claim it to be? And we're going to now have a quick look at bird's eye view, remember, of why the Quran is a living miracle. First and foremost, the book is par excellence. There's nothing that compares to it, nothing that comes close to it. it provides a complete guide of our life here and in the hereafter. It provides a blueprint on how we are to live. It shows us how we need to, to live amongst one another, how we should treat our children, how we should treat our mothers, how we should treat our parents, how we should do business, how we should look after the poor, the sick, the needy, how we are to do business. This is a complete guide. It's a very small book, but it has so much information in it. If you look at books that try to help civilization and try to help mankind, we have libraries full of books just trying to tell people how to deal with people's psychological problems. We have that in a few pages. We have volumes of books telling people how to get on with their family and how to have successful relationships with their family. And we have just a few pages. A few pages of power. This book is a book par excellence. There is nothing that comes close to it. With a few words, with a maximum amount of information. A few words with maximum amount of information. It is available in the language and it was revealed in the language that it was originally revealed in, in Arabic. It was revealed in Arabic and it's still available in Arabic. But it is also available in the language of the average man. And it has been so for many years. You can pick it up in any shop, or in any Islamic shop that is. And you can pick it up and you can read it in your language. You can read it in your home language. That even your child will be able to understand. It is unmatched in its diction and its sound and in its rendering. It is so poetic and so beautifully put together that scholars throughout the world have admired it and said that this is a writing that no human being could have possibly done on his own with his own thinking. This has to be a super book. It has to be done by a superhuman because there's no way a human being could have written it so easily. This is something that not a human being on this planet could have done. So this is a super book. It's accurate in its description of facts. When it describes things, it is accurate. In the following episode that will come on, there will be a discussion on the facts that are found in the Quran. Today we're looking at the light of the Quran. And we will find that so many facts that the Quran had have been proven by modern science, by modern medicine, by modern geology. And it has a book that has information in it that we are still only discovering. So the Quran is the most pure book. It is unpolluted. It hasn't been interpolluted by other faiths and other religions and modern um, discoveries. It has been pre the modern discoveries. Modern discoveries have been affected by the Holy Quran. Many of the things that we see in the Holy Quran, people are now realizing that the Quran had centuries before the scientists had had. It has information about uh, information that we are still busy researching at this point in time. It remains pure. It has no contradictions or inconsistencies. Now there are people that have been given the challenge to pick up the Quran and study the Quran and come back to us Muslims, come back to the Muslim scholars, come back to the Muslim community and show us the contradictions or the inconsistencies. We've waited for 1,400 years. We'll wait for another 1,400 years because there will not be any. It has influenced the lives of people and is responsible for changing people throughout the world. And it has been responsible for the spread of Islam for over 1,400 years, and it remains so, and it will continue to do so, inshallah, as long as Allah wills it to. So when we come back, we're going to have a short break, 
When we come back, we will continue to look why and who wrote the Quran. Welcome back. And now we continue with a look at the authors of, possible authors of the Quran. So now, who is the author of the Quran? You see, Islam and the Quran are inseparable. You, you can't remove them from one another. You see, if you take away the Quran, there is no Islam, because Islam is held together, the religion of Islam. Obviously, we all submit to the will of Allah. But the Quran shows us how to solidify that relationship with Allah. Shows us how to be a good practicing Muslim. So who is the author of the Quran? There are three possible candidates when it comes to who authored the Quran. And I ask that the viewers who are watching at home, listen to the complete descriptions and don't jump to any conclusions. Wait for the, the whole uh, description to be completed before jumping into conclusions. So who is the author of the Quran? Is it one, the Arabs? Two, is it the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Or three, is it Allah Ta'ala? Is it God Almighty who gave us the Quran? Who is the author of the Quran? So let's look at the first one. The first one, the Arabs are the author of the Quran. Is it possible that the Arabs are the author of the Holy Quran? What Quran teaches goes directly against what the pagan Arabs believed at that time. It goes against their culture. It goes against their religions. It goes against all the gods that they had at that time. The Arab culture existed before the Quran was revealed. And so all these things that the Arabs held so dear to themselves, like their culture, their multiple religions, their multiple gods, all the things that they did, it wouldn't make any sense for them to lose all that business, all that, that income, all that financing, to suddenly change and get rid of all those gods and go for one god. So the Arab culture, they would never have done this. They wouldn't have written a book. They would have made them lose lots of finances and popularity and influence in the, in the world that they were in at that time. No, they would never have done that. It would have gone directly against the pagan Arab culture to adopt this religion, to adopt this god, and to adopt the Holy Quran. The second point is the Quran condemns idol worshipping. So even the people, even if they got rid of the idols, they were condemning themselves. The pagans were condemning themselves because they were worshippers of these idols. But the Arabs loved their idols. They loved their idol gods. And they had these idols that they, they would go and dress and clean and wash and parade through the city. And they worshipped them regularly. So it doesn't make any sense that they would want to get rid of it. The Quran also raised the status of woman. It was far beyond anything that the West had ever done. Islam 1,400 years ago gave women the same rights as men. It made them no longer cattle, but human beings. And this was a great threat to the Arab people. So they definitely wouldn't have wanted to do that. They definitely wouldn't want the status that the woman raised, that they were now human beings, and they could make up their own decisions of what they wanted to do, could own what they wanted, could be educated, could employ people. This would have gone against the Arab culture. So it definitely wouldn't have benefited the Arabs to write the Holy Quran. The Arabs would never have written something that goes against the most important belief of idol worship for them. And that is that they could do what they want. So they definitely wouldn't have done this. The only possible reason that the Arabs would have had to author the Quran is that if they wanted to get some financial gain, some type of political gain. And of course they get none of these from being the author of the Quran. So who could be the author of the Quran? The second one that people have, have claimed is that the author of the Quran has to be the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They said it has to be that the, the Prophet Muhammad, he is the author of the Quran. And so historians, if we look at historians, great writers, not some backstreet guys, but well-respected, well-researched historians, have claimed and stand by the point that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was illiterate, that he was unable to read and write, and he wasn't a lettered man. In fact, it even says in the Quran, in chapter 7, uh, verse 157, that Muhammad was illiterate. So the, the Quran itself confirms that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was illiterate. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had no reason to come up with something like the Quran, to cause his society, to cause his people, to cause the Arabs to become his enemies, would have been a silly thing for him to do. He would have purposely gone out of his way to make people his enemy, by choosing to be the author of the Quran himself and decided that he was going to come up with his own idea and make up the whole thing. Why would somebody want to make himself the enemy of the people? And so he wouldn't have done anything like that. It wouldn't have made any sense. Why would he write something going against almost all the norms 
and the ways of society at that time. You see, the society at that time would have rejected him. His, he would have lost his family, he would have lost his friends, he would have lost his loved ones, not to mention his wealth, which he had have lost as well. Furthermore, another reason why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the person who sat down and thought, well, let me make up this whole new religion and, and write a book of wonders that I just came up with. It's because the Quran was revealed over a 23-year period. 23 years. That's a very, very long time. And it's impossible for someone to maintain the same exact style of Arabic speech for 23 years without making a mistake, as it has been demonstrated in the Quran for over 23 years. Now, if we look at other texts, say we take the, the Bible, for example, it's disjointed. Every time it changes, if we look for uh, those who um, understand anything about the Bible, or we come from a Christian background, we have the book of Daniel, for example. The first part of Daniel speaks in the first person, and the second part of Daniel suddenly goes to the third person. Daniel talks about events that took place that he wasn't even at. Daniel talks about himself in the first person and the third person, backwards and forwards in other texts. So there's no consistency, and we find that throughout many of the scriptures. But we find with the Quran that it is an exact same style from the beginning of the Quran to the end of the Quran. No faltering, no changes. Also, what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to say is recorded what he used to say and what he used to do is recorded in the hadith and in the sunnah and we look at the style that it is written in is unmatched it is perfect in every way the other thing is that if we look at the arabic style of the hadith and the arabic style of the quran we find that the style of the quran is unique and it wasn't something that was common around that time and it made it very different and distinguishable from any other arabic style that was around during that time so it could not have been written by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was something that was above his capabilities, above his understanding, above his, his way of thinking. So it had to be a supernatural uh, author that was involved. So we have written off the Arabs and we've written off the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the authors of being able to do that. It does not make any sense that a man has two unique, distinguishable and complete different styles of communicating the one that we hear about when we have the hadith written about him, he has a different way of talking and different way of describing things and different style. He has a, his signature almost the way he speaks, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and that's recorded in the hadith. And then when we come to the Quran, it's totally different. So we can see that it, it doesn't make sense that it's authored by the same person. And yet another reason why the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him couldn't have possibly written the Quran is that it is written in a way about things and information in a style that he had no knowledge of. He didn't know. He was living in a society where people thought the earth was flat. They didn't understand how embryo was formed. They had no idea how mountains were formed. They didn't even really understand how rain was formed. And so the author of the Quran has to be and cannot be anyone else, any other source from any other continent or any other human being. No aliens came down. It can only have possibly have come from Allah to Allah. Allah is the author of the Quran. Yes, he is. There is no one else that could have possibly done it. So the Quran is authored by Allah. Cannot be anybody else. In the fourth chapter of the Quran, in verse 82, it says, Do they not consider or ponder on the Quran? If there had been any other except Allah, they would surely have found it to be much contradictory. Very contradictory. They would find there to be much contradiction. There would be much discrepancy in it. And this is what the, the Quran says about itself. It's admitting that if this is a fake, you'll find contradictions in it. If this Quran is written by a human being, you'll find that he will contradict himself, but you don't find that. Then it also says in the 21st chapter of the Quran, verse 10, it says, We have revealed unto you, O man, a book in which a message is for you. So this is a message for you that you will understand, that you will understand. It's not a book that is unable to be understood. It's not a book that is written above people so that they will say, well, I don't know what this means. It's not like writings of fake prophets that have come over the years. We have people who claim that things will happen, and we find that they, they speak in such uh, terms that it could fit anything. Anything that happens in the future, it will fit. Uh, Nostradamus, people will say, yes, see, Nostradamus' prophecies came true. But he writes them in such a vague way, and he talks about things in such a vague way that anything can fit it. You know the amazing thing about the Quran is that if a law was passed, and this may be not be in the too distant future that this law may be passed, because we see certain countries in the world 
preventing a woman from wearing a hijab. We see certain countries in the world that prevent uh, Muslims from even having a mosque in them, in those countries. So it might be possible in the future that we may not be allowed to even read the Quran. But if a law was passed tomorrow and all the Qurans in the world were destroyed, every single last Quran was destroyed, and the presidents of the world stood together and said, see, we've destroyed all the Qurans. Amongst the middle of them, one would pop up. And they would burn that one and another one would pop up in its place. You could not destroy all the Qurans even if you tried to. Because even if they managed to destroy all the Qurans, by the end of the afternoon, we'd have written it out again. Because scholars have put a thing in our young people's minds, have put a spirit into the young people's minds. Our scholars have, have given people a hunger to study the Qur'an. And so no matter what you try to do to destroy the Qur'an, it will always reproduce itself. It will produce itself back again. It will come back to life again. Our young people, there are people uh, 13, 14, 15 years old who can rewrite the entire Qur'an by the end of the day. They would sit down, a group of them together, and we'd rewrite it. Do you think our brothers in the Christian community, or the Jewish community, or the Hindu community, or whatever religion you want to choose, would be able to do it in 10 lifetimes, in 20 lifetimes, in 1,000 lifetimes, be able to produce their book that they're using. Yet our scholars can do it in, by the end of the day. So now whatever you do to the Quran, we'll bring it back again. Because the Quran has been protected. It is by the hand of Allah. You cannot destroy what is Allah's. You cannot steal from Allah. You cannot destroy from Allah. You cannot deceive Allah. Whatever you produce is going to be, it will be born and it will decay. Whatever is produced by Allah, cannot be born and decay, and cannot decay. It will remain forever, it will remain constant. Now, the teachings of, of the, the Quran we can see are not any way, in any shape or form written by man. These are eternal testimonies, they are of divine origin. This is the Holy Quran. It is divine, it is eternal. It cannot have any manipulation from humankind. It is a language that supersedes anything that has ever come before it, and it will supersede anything that comes after it. This is the final message to mankind. It will not change. No matter how much you wish it to go, it will not go. No matter how many things you say against it, it will still remain. It says in the 15th chapter of the Quran, verse 9, it says, Indeed, it is we who have sent down the reminder, in other words, the Quran. And indeed, it is us who shall preserve it. In other words, Allah is promising that this book came down from Allah to Allah, and He Himself will preserve it. So we know that this book cannot have come from the Arabs, it could not have come from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it can only have come from Allah himself. In the Holy Quran, in chapter 61, verse 9, it says, And it is he who has sent his messenger with guidance, the religion of truth, that he may proclaim it all over the region. And so we have seen that the message and the messenger come together. And in the years to come, as you read the Quran, and as you become a stronger Muslim, and as you get closer to Allah, I hope that you will realize this precious gift that you have been given in the Quran, and that you will find at least an hour a day to spend reading the word of Allah. Jazakallah, and may you grow from strength to strength in your faith in Islam.